The chi-squared test is an important statistical concept that is applied in many sciences and especially in biology. That being said, the chi-squared test is used both in the AP Statistics and AP Biology exam. In this video, we will be applying the statistical concept to biology, providing enough background on the math concept to see why it is important in biology and how it can be applied to our day-to-day -day lives. First, we must understand why we use chi-square tests and other statistical tests like it in the real world. In essence, why is one statistical test used instead of another in different situations and experiments? When we are first deciding which test to use, we must ask two questions. First, what is the purpose of our experiment? Is it to find a relationship or connection between different groups, like looking for an equation that relates height and flexibility, or trying to see if a certain medication dosage is linked to recovery time? Or is it for comparison? That is, trying to understand whether there is a difference between different groups, such as females versus males, or control versus treatment groups. Second, we must see what type of data we are looking at. The two main categories are continuous, which is quantitative or numerical, and categorical, which is qualitative. For a chi-square test, we mainly deal with categorical data as we are categorizing our data in a qualitative manner and either comparing or finding a relationship between such qualities. But how can a single test be used for multiple purposes of our experiments? Well, there are actually three different types of chi-square tests that can be used. The first is known as the chi-square goodness of fit. When we shop for a gene or even a college, we want to make sure it's a good fit. Statistics is the same in that we want to make sure our model or preconceptions are a good fit for the data we have. Our models or preconceptions can be defined through a null hypothesis, which you can think of as being like our default position. When we carry out our experiments and actually calculate our test statistics, we seek to see whether we can reject or fail to reject this null hypothesis. For chi-squared goodness of fit, the null hypothesis is that the population distribution of the categorical variable in question matches some hypothesized distribution. Such categorical variables can be summarized in a one-way table, which is often given in our problems or is what we gather through our experiments. A two-way table exists as well, which summarizes data regarding two categorical variables, with such tables made in two different ways leading to two more different types of chi-square tests. The second type of chi-square test is known as the chi-squared homogeneity test. This test seeks to determine whether the distribution of a single categorical variable is the same for each of several populations or treatments. The null hypothesis for these tests is that there is no difference in the distribution of a categorical variable for several populations or treatments. Note how this differs from the chi-squared goodness of fit test, and that for goodness of fit, we are comparing a singular population distribution to a preconceived model, while homogeneity test compares populations or treatments among each other to see a difference, hence the name homogeneity, which implies that there is no difference and these populations are the same. Therefore, both the goodness of fit and homogeneity tests share the purpose of comparison, but what they compare is different. The third and final type of chi-square test is known as the chi-squared independence test. This test has a different purpose from the last two, namely that it is a relationship test. Such a test sees whether there is convincing evidence of an association between the row and column variables in a two-way table, basically a relationship between two categorical variables. This test's null hypothesis is that there is no association between the two categorical variables in the population of interest, or that these two variables are independent, hence the name independence test. Overall, these chi-square tests can provide a way to see if the variation in your data is just due to chance, or if it is due to one of the variables that you're actually testing, that is whether we can actually compare such data or if there is a relationship we are not seeing. To do so, we first need to calculate our chi-square test statistic. This is done by comparing our observations to our expectations. Our numerator has the observed difference, literally our observed minus expected outcomes, which we would expect if the null hypothesis is true, which is divided again by what we expected as our outcomes. Before we look at some problems, we also need to define some important terms, namely the degrees of freedom, the chi-squared critical value, and our significance level. The whole point of a chi-square test is either to reject or fail to reject our null hypothesis, and so you have to either exceed or not exceed your critical value. But we first need to figure out what that value is from a chart, or table C, commonly used on the AP statistics test and textbooks. The first column over here shows the DF, or degrees of freedom value. Since we are comparing outcomes of our experiments, we take how many different outcomes can occur and subtract that by 1 to get our degrees of freedom value. 
Now, the reason why there isn't a zero on this chart is because a zero degrees of freedom implies that there's only one outcome of our experiment, and there would be no need for this test because there's nothing to compare that singular outcome to. Now, the critical value comes from looking at the column, where our degrees of freedom are, and matching them with our significance level, our probability from our first row. For biology, our significance level is always 5 per percent, but in statistics, that can sometimes change depending on the scenario presented. If our critical value is less than our calculated chi-squared value, then we can reject our null hypothesis. On the other hand, if our calculated chi-squared value is less than our critical value, we fail to reject our null hypothesis. This makes sense because if you see on the table, the greater the critical value is, the less the probability becomes. So there's a decreased chance of us achieving those higher critical values due to chance alone, and if our outcomes exceed it, then our findings are even more significant, enough to reject the null hypothesis. On the other hand, a smaller test statistic in comparison to the critical value means that we have a greater probability of what we observe occurring due to chance alone, and so there isn't enough convincing evidence or significant evidence for us to disregard the null hypothesis. Let's look at an example of a chi-squared problem. Note first how this is a goodness of fit test. We want our observed data to fall in line with our classic Mendelian ratio of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 for a dihybrid cross, which we had learned in biology for being flawed because it was too ideal and did not take into account variations in Mendelian principles, such as polygenic inheritance or codominance. Goodness of fit tests are often useful in genetics, where the laws of probability can give an expected proportion of outcomes in every category, such as in this dihybrid cross. Let's see if this experiment from the problem either follows classic Mendelian genetic principles or diverges from this ideal. In this question, we are given our observed values for a dihybrid experiment, namely through the number of organisms, who are dominant for both traits, which is 570, dominant for the first trait and recessive for the second, which is 185, recessive for the first trait and dominant for the second, which is 190, and recessive for both traits, which is 55. From there, we have to calculate our expected values. We do so by first counting our total number of organisms, which is 1,000. In the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio, we know that 9 out of 16 of the 1,000 plants will be dominant for both traits, which is 563. 3 out of 16 of the 1,000 plants will be dominant for trait 1, but recessive for trait 2, leading to 188. Again, another 3 out of 16 of the 1,000 plants will be dominant, however now for trait 2 and recessive for trait 1, leading again to 188. And only one out of every 16 plants of the total 100 will be recessive for both traits, leading to 63. Now we calculate our chi-squared test statistic, which we remember is the sum of all outcomes observed minus expected value squared over our expected values. Therefore, we subtract each expected value from its observed for each combination of traits, square that remaining value, and divide each by its expected outcome. When we add up all these values from the last column, we get the total sum as 1.172, which represents our test statistic. Now, there are four possible outcomes on this table leading to three degrees of freedom with a significance level of 5%, so this is a biology example and we are not told otherwise. Looking at our table, we see that our critical value is 7.81, which is significantly greater than our calculated test statistic. Therefore, we fail to reject our null hypothesis. There is not convincing evidence that such results occur due to chance alone, and our sample of 1,000 organisms follow the expected 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. I hope this video helped you to learn more about chi-squared and its applications in biology.